Good morning again. We're so excited to be able to transition into a time of God's Word. I want to, uh, at this time, just say a word of prayer. It's what we do on Sunday mornings. We say, God, would you speak to our hearts? And I want to challenge you wherever you're at uh, to pray this prayer with me or a prayer like it. And really, it's just a prayer of saying, God, would you speak to me? And whether you're uh, watching from afar, for those of you that are in this building, let's ask God to speak to our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your powerful word. And I pray, God, that you would just speak to every one of us as we unpack this message this morning. God, use me not only to share the message, Lord God, but I pray that you would also speak to my heart this morning. God, we know that you are the God of the miraculous. And we ask, God, that you would so move and minister to our hearts this morning. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So, good morning, JCC family. Uh, You know, I don't know about you, but uh, does anyone else feel like it's Groundhog Day? (laughs) Some of you are like, what are you talking about? Well, here's the thing. You know, there's a movie that came out in the early 90s, and uh, it was a movie called Groundhog Day where an individual relived the same day over and over and over and over again. And I have to say, that's kind of what it feels like when we are walking through COVID-19, right? This season is really starting to, uh, in some ways, uh, let's just be, let's say it nicely, get on my nerves, you know what I'm saying? Like this season is just like starting to get on my nerves, but I have to remind myself of the blessings as well. I have to be intentional to tune in to the blessings to the blessings of what God is doing. And so for the past several weeks, we've been in a message series that we're calling Deeper. And I can say it has forced me personally to go deeper in my relationship with the Lord. And it's also, I hope, forced you to go deeper in your relationship with God. I pray, that's my prayer, is that we haven't just gone through the motions of the last several weeks, but that we've truly taken a time to say, God, let me go deeper in my relationship with you. And so last week we talked about gaining a deeper understanding of God and and really just who is he? Like we would define him a lot of ways. Uh, We've discovered overwhelmingly that God is good, right? God is good. And all the time? Yeah, that's, you know, uh, some of y'all remember that. Some of you don't. That's okay. You're still with us and we thank you for that. Um, So overwhelmingly though, God is good. And as our Heavenly Father, He has a redemptive plan for our lives at every moment, at every turn. It's not just for our salvation, but the truth is, is that He will take every situation and redeem it for His purposes in our lives. He always has our best interest in mind. And so our takeaway from last week was this. Our God is good and loving Heavenly Father. Our God is a good and loving Heavenly Father. And what a reminder for us. That at every moment, God is good. And that at every moment, he's a loving Heavenly Father. And again, I don't know, sometimes you may may, uh, uh, look to God as a father and it messes up your relationship with him because of an earthly father. But I want to remind you that God is a perfect father, that he is the epitome of fatherhood. And so any bad example that you and I may have experienced in our lives, we have to remind ourselves that there is no one like our Heavenly Father. And so uh, God can be defined in a lot of ways, but again, he's perfect. He always has our best interest in mind. He doesn't create negative situations in our lives, but I can tell you that he can redeem every situation of our lives. And so as we gain a deeper understanding of the Lord, I ask you another question today, and I really want you to ponder this for a moment. I really want you to think about it just for a moment today. It's, a, it's really a, a question that I think challenges our perspective on God. Again, as we dig deeper into knowing who he is and understanding him, here's the question that I have for you this morning. Is God still in the business of doing the miraculous? Think about that for a moment. Is God still in the business of doing the miraculous. You see, throughout the Bible and throughout the biblical narrative, we see God perform miracle after miracle after miracle. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament are filled with stories of God's miraculous intervention in the lives of his people. We see it over and over again. We see him work. We see him move. And over the course of history, the miraculous nature of God has been questioned. 
Like, let's be honest. Like, if you follow history and you follow what began to transpire uh, throughout the, uh, you know, 16 and 1700s and even into the 1800s, there was a lot of questioning about the miraculous God that we serve. There was a lot of questions. In fact, you may not know this. You may not understand this. But many of our founding fathers, they are what we would call deists. And, and, and what is a deist? The deist is somebody who believes in God. They believe that there's a God of creation, but they don't believe that he is invested in the lives of people. They don't, they don't believe that. So they believe that there's a higher power, if you will, or a creative God, but they don't believe that he still interacts and meddles in the business of people today. They also don't believe in the miracles. And so many of our founding fathers, though they were, they were, they were believing in a God, they also didn't believe in the God of the Bible necessarily. They didn't believe in the God of the miraculous. They even minimized the miracles of Jesus. And over the past several hundred years, I think we've lost touch with the miraculous God of creation. Like, we, 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 we've lost touch. And, and, and not that God hasn't showed up in miraculous ways over the last uh, several hundred years. He certainly has. But I think as a culture, as a believing people, we, we, we tend to really think that God only worked miraculously way back when or in some other country or some other c- circumstance. But I would just say, again, our miracles for today. Are they for today? Does God intervene on behalf of his people today? Is he a God that is involved in the very details of our lives? In short, I would answer those questions with a resounding yes. God is absolutely in the business of doing the miraculous. And so I want to take a journey through God's word this morning, and I want to discover his miracle working ability. But here's the other part. I want to discover his miracle working probability in our lives. It's not just enough to know that God can perform miracles or has performed miracles. You've got to know that God wants to perform a miracle in your life, in your story, in your family, in your situation. For too long, we've relegated God to some mystical being way off far somewhere, but he's active in our lives. He wants to do the miraculous through our lives, and we've got to believe him for it this morning. He not only is the God of the miraculous, and it's not just way off somewhere. It's right here, right now. He wants to do the miraculous in our lives. And so as we continue to go deeper in our understanding of the Lord and take the time to read his word, there are countless miracles from beginning to end. We see so many miracles. And as I, I think there's an interesting storyline to the individual in the Bible that we've, become known, that, that we've known as Job. Job is an interesting character. His story's interesting. But Job, he goes through a series of trials in his life. And as he's going through those trials, he, there's a lot of people around him that are questioning God. They're questioning the goodness of God, but they're also declaring the goodness of God. And so there's this interesting conversation that goes on for chapter after chapter after chapter. I want to look to uh, two notable moments in the book of Job where we see this conversation that Job is having with his friends. In particular, we're going to look at Eliphaz and, and Zophar and what they say. There's two things. And so the first thing is that there's, Eliphaz makes this statement about God in Job chapter 5 and verse 9. And what he says is he says this, he performs, speaking of God, he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. Like, let that settle into your heart for a moment. We're talking about the God of creation. And, and really what he's declaring here is that God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. There are so many moments in my life where I look at the wonders of God, and truthfully, I can't fathom them. Truthfully, I don't understand them. It goes on, it says, miracles that cannot be counted. You see, I remember there's a song back in the day. And back in the day, the song said, uh, you do miracles, you do miracles so great. And I'm not going to even try to sing it, but it's, it's, it, was a, it was a song right around the time I was saved. And it just, I remember, actually, I remember singing that song on the mission field in Spanish. And I didn't even know Spanish, but I knew that it was, I knew the tune. And I remember just raising my hands in that moment and thinking, God, you're the God of the miraculous right here on the mission field. And so that's who he is. He's the God of the miraculous. And, and so he, his miracles cannot be counted. And so I love what Zophar goes on to say in 
Job chapter 11, verses 7 and 9. It says this, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you fathom the mysteries of God? See, here's the thing. We all want to put God in a pretty little box because ultimately what we want to do is we want to control God and we actually want to control our life narrative because we're, here's the truth. We're so selfish when you really get down to it. It's really all about me, myself, you and I. And if I can even control the God of creation, yeah, anyway, that's another message. Let's stay with the text. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? Can you probe, listen to the verbiage, can you probe the limits of the Almighty? Because, see, we want to say God ends here. And God can work over there, but he can't work here. And I want you to know God has no limits. There's no limit to what he can do and how he can move and when he can move and where he can move. And so every limitation that we put over God, he'll just go, he's just going to blow them off if we will allow him to. Can you probe? the limits of God, or the limits of the Almighty. They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. I love it. Their measure, when you begin to measure God, when you begin to measure his works and you begin to measure how he moves, it's certainly wider than the earth and deeper than the sea. So powerful. You see, God's ways are limitless. He is higher and deeper than we can ever understand or even comprehend. We can't even fathom it. That's what the Bible is saying to us. And we see in, in, in the biblical narrative, we see miracles in the Old Testament And we see where God is working, not just in the Old Testament, but when you look at the lives of the Israelites and how he begins to move in the lives of the Israelites, we see how he does so many miracles and and one after the other. And there's all this miraculous working of God. But it also shows up in the New Testament and specifically in the life and ministry of Jesus. The, The miraculous shows up. I mean... I mean, it doesn't just start when he start, begins his public ministry. That's not where it begins. I mean, the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin, I mean, there's already the miraculous is written all over it. The miraculous is there. And so we understand and we realize and we see that Jesus is, in so many ways, carrying on the miracles of the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact... Jesus performed a total of 38 miracles which are recorded in the Gospels. When we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are these distinct miracles, miracles of healing, miracles over nature, miracles of provision, miracles of raising the dead, even Jesus raising himself from the dead, miracles of freeing the demon possessed, and several others along the way, God Uh, continues his miracle working power, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament through the life and ministry of Jesus. I love what John says about it. In John chapter 21 and verse 25, he says this about Jesus and the miraculous. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. That Jesus did so many things, but they're not all recorded. Not everyone is recorded and not all the details are recorded, but there's enough recorded for us to know that the God that was miraculous in the Old Testament is the same God that's miraculous in the New Testament. And in one of Jesus' miracles, a father brings a boy who's been demon-possessed since he was very young. I love this story. It's a story that every one of us can identify with. You see... As we discover and go deeper with God, we're talking about the God of the miraculous today. And it's easy to read a story and hear a story and feel like you can't identify with it. But I think that every one of us can identify with today's story. And so there's this young man, he's been demon-possessed, and his father brings him to Jesus for him to be set free. And the entire story is great, but I want to pick up. On on not all of it, we're going to miss a few verses on on the front end and back end. Just a few if you want to read it. It's in Mark chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 17. Mark chapter 9 and verse 17. It says, the man in the crowd answered. Again, there was a conversation going on before this. Go read your Bible this week. It will do you really good. Verse 17, a man in the crowd answered, teacher, 
I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever he seizes him, whenever it seizes him, it throws him into the ground. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. This is a very descriptive moment that the father's bringing to Jesus. He's saying, look, this is what's happened to my son. And so it goes on to read, and it says, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Interesting dialogue here. Follow the story. Jesus is there. There's a crowd. There's a conversation going on. This guy's bringing his son, and he tells Jesus, this is what happens to him. This is what goes on. And Jesus actually, if you realize his response, he seems a little bit annoyed. Now we know like he wasn't completely, okay? Follow me. But he does seem a little bit annoyed, okay? Just a, just a little bit. Pastor Drew, stay with me. He says here in verse 19, you unbelieving generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. You unbelieving generation. You know, he gets to this moment where he says, you unbelieving generation. He's, he's a little bit fed up. And he says, bring the boy to me. In verse 20, so they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately, what's that word say? Immediately. That means like right now. Okay. Track with me. So it says immediately, it immediately rather, threw the boy into a convulsion and he fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Now you just got to know that this is pretty interesting. If I fell down on the floor right now and I started rolling around, y'all would just, this would be a crazy moment. Watch. Let me show you what that would look like. Just kidding. Just kidding. And so it's a very interesting scene. He falls down. He starts to roll around. He begins to foam at the mouth. You know, this is a really vivid depiction of what's going on. Verse 21, it says, Jesus asked the boy's father. So Jesus sees this happening. And he looks to the father and he says, let's talk a little bit. I don't know about you, but I think the right response in that moment would for Jesus to immediately, just as this spirit threw this little boy onto the ground and he started rolling around and foaming out the mouth, I think it would be appropriate for Jesus to at that moment do something. But he doesn't. He only says, how long has he been like this? It reads on. From childhood, he answered. It is often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. So, I don't know about you, I have some amazing daughters. And if my daughters had this moment where they fell on the ground and they started rolling around and foaming at the mouth, and at times, this spirit literally tried to take them to the water to drown them and throw them into fire to burn them. How, can, how many of you would say that's pretty dramatic? That's a pretty dramatic situation. And he says, as he tells them what's going on, but if you can, do anything. Key phrase, but if you can. Remember Jesus said, you unbelieving generation." And why Jesus is speaking to that is because even in this moment, this father is standing before the son of almighty God. And he's saying, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus replied, everything is possible for one who believes. And I love the response, if you can. So many times when we look to God, we say, God, if you can. And what we forget to understand is that he is absolutely capable in every moment, in every situation. Like he doesn't have an inability problem. You know, that he is absolutely able and absolutely capable, capable of doing the miraculous in our lives. But in this moment, the father says, if you can. 
Jesus' response, I love it. If you can, really, do you not know who you're talking to? Do you not understand who I am? Do you not understand that I am that I am? That I was the beginning and I will be the end? Do you not understand that when the Red Seas were opened, I was there? Do you not understand when the walls of Jericho fell down, I was there? Do you not understand that at all, every miracle in the Old Testament, I was there? And every miracle that that's transpiring around me, I'm here. Do you not understand? If I can, everything is possible for the one who believes. And then the dialogue really comes very close to home. Verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. You see, the challenge is, is that we have to understand that ultimately this, this father is saying, I believe. He's ultimately saying, I, I do believe, but I'm struggling to believe. And so if you've struggled to believe, you're in good company. If you're in a moment where you've said, you know what, I, I don't know that I can believe God to work in this situation of my life, you are in good company because every one of us have moments of doubt. We have moments of struggle. We have moments of fight. And what I do know is that in the middle of all of that, we can trust God and we can believe God and he will absolutely come through. And so verse 25 goes on. It says, when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure, uh, impure spirit. The challenge is, is that there's so much going on in this moment. There's a crowd flocking. There's all kinds of scenarios taking place where uh, people are, are, are wanting to see what's transpiring and what's happening. There's a scene quite literally breaking out. And, and the people begin to come. And now finally Jesus takes the moment after he's had the conversation, after he's gone through the motions with the father and they've discussed all that's happening. And he's, the little boy's rolling around on the ground and he comes to this moment and he he says, he speaks, you deaf and mute spirit, he said. Now, ultimately, the, the interesting thing about this spirit is it was deaf. It could not hear. But the moment that Jesus spoke, he heard. The moment that Jesus began to declare over his life, in that moment, God ultimately spoke to a spirit that was deaf. And in your life, you might be feeling like you're tired of COVID-19. You're tired of a situation in your life. You're tired of a mess in your life. I want you to know that where you feel discouraged and down and like there's an enemy that's trying to, to cause death and discouraging moments in your life. The God of creation is going to speak into that moment. You've got to believe it. You've got to know that's who he is. He's going to speak to that moment. And so he comes in and Jesus says, you deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him. And never enter him again. And I'm declaring that over your life and in your situation and in my life and in my situation, just like the Jesus is declaring, he's, he's declaring for this spirit to leave. And so many times we feel like the spirit that's coming against us, whatever it might be, is, is not leaving. But when Jesus speaks, that spirit will leave. It says, and never enter him again. There's a moment where you feel like you're, you're, you just can't keep going. There's a moment where you feel like you can't keep believing God for your daughter. You can't keep believing God for your family. You can't keep believing God for your health or some other situation in your life. But I want you to know when Jesus speaks, you might not feel it. You might not know it with your physical eyes, but with your spiritual eyes, you've got to know that the God of creation has spoken to that situation in your life. And he's cast out every deaf and dark and depressing spirit from your life and when it's gone it's gone there is no coming back and you have to have the faith to say we believe I believe in that verse 26 it says the spirit shrieked it's interesting because it said that the spirit was not only deaf but that the spirit was mute it couldn't speak but the moment Jesus spoke it heard and the moment Jesus spoke it also spoke it shrieked it convulsed him violently and came out the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead you see, here's the thing. When God works in your life, 
When God does something miraculous in your life, when God begins to move in your life, you have to know that when he speaks and things start to change, you may look the same. People might be around you and they say your situation looks the same and it looks dead and it looks like a corpse. That's okay. They can say what they want to say. But I'm telling you, the naysayers don't have the final word. God has the final word in your life. And when he speaks to that dead thing and people are looking around and saying the boy's dead, he's a corpse, you got to know that the end of the story is not the end of the story quite yet because it goes on to read and it says but Jesus somebody say but Jesus and but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up when Jesus speaks when Jesus speaks to a scenario when Jesus speaks to a situation Everybody else might be saying he's dead. Everybody else might be saying the situation looks as dire as it ever has looked. We might be looking at COVID-19 and saying it still feels discouraging. It still feels dark. It still feels lifeless. But what we have to know is that God Almighty is speaking life where death used to be. And we might still identify with death, but life and life abundantly is coming our way in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. And so I ask you, are miracles for today? Again, I would say absolutely yes. Miracles are for right now. May we not forget the reminder of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. You see, the miracles of the biblical narrative and the miracles throughout human history, they have not been all used up. They are not only for a time past. They are for today. They are for you. They are for right now. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he's done it before, he can do it again. If he's doing it right now, you've got to know that he's got your future in his hands. He's going to work out that situation you're worried about in your life. He is the God of the miraculous. We can believe him for his miracles. We can believe him to show up in the same way he showed up in the, in the beginning. In the same way he showed up in the end, we can believe him to show up today in our lives. We might struggle to believe. We may have moments just like the moment that this father had as he stood across from Jesus and he shared his doubt, and he shared his discouragement, and he shared all that he was feeling, and he shared his situation. We may have doubts, but we've got to declare this morning, no matter what we feel, no matter what we think, we've got to boldly declare, I believe my God for the miraculous. And so as a takeaway today, we boldly declare this, I believe my God for the miraculous. Yeah, but I don't see it, but I don't know how this is going to work out in my life, but I don't know how God is going to move, but I don't know how God is going to line this up for me. I don't know when this breakthrough is going to come. I don't know when the breakthrough is going to, going to arrive. And in all of those questions, in all of those moments, in all of those doubts, we have to declare, I believe my God for the miraculous. You have to come to a moment in your life where you declare, I believe believe my God despite of what my physical eyes see. I believe. I believe. You need to declare it. I believe. And so just for a moment right here, as we prepare to close today, I want you just for a moment to think through the work of God in your life. Because we've all seen the miraculous in different ways, at different moments, I've seen the miraculous in my life on the day-to-day -day basis, to be quite honest with you. It's a miracle I'm alive. But I've also seen the miracles of God on a foreign mission field where I'm in the middle of a plaza and there's a kid with a golf ball size a tumor on his chest. I've seen God dissipate it. But I'll tell you, in all those miracles I've watched and all those things I've seen, there is no greater miracle than the miracle of God saving an individual of a person coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want you to know that Jesus, more than ever, he wants to save you. More than ever, he wants you to know that he loves you. And more than ever, he wants to do the miraculous in your life. But if you've never committed your life to Christ, if you've maybe gotten away from that commitment to Christ, then there is no greater miracle than for you to decide today to commit your life to Christ. And if that's you, I want to invite you to pray a simple prayer with me. Right where you're at, would you just say, Jesus, today, 
Save me. Set me free. Work in my life like never before. From this day forward, show me your ways, your miraculous ways. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you that prayed that prayer, I believe with you that God is doing such a miracle in your life. And I just want to encourage you right there where you're at to know that today is the best day of your life. It's the beginning of the rest of your life. And God wants to do something absolutely miraculous in and through your life. It starts today. If you made that decision for the very first time or you recommitted your life to Christ today, let us know. Whether you're on the church online platform, you can raise your hand digitally right there in the comment section and you can let us know that's me. Or if you're watching somewhere else, you can also let us know. We want to be praying with you. We want to be believing with you. But what we do know is that we serve the God of the miraculous. And so as we prepare for a moment of worship today, we're going to worship the God of the, uh, of the miraculous. And I want you to, as we worship, really think through not only what God has done, not only what God might do, but I want you to believe that God will work in you right now. Let's worship together.